Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a, a completely new method of growing very early stem cells. So these aren't adult stem cells or, or bone marrow cells. We're talking about embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. And um, how do I go to the... Our company is Minerva Biotechnologies. Um, how many in the audience have heard about naive versus primed stem cells? Okay. Okay, great. Well, that's the, the basis of what I'm going to talk about. And essentially, about seven or eight years ago, some researchers started asking the question, how come we're, it's so easy to work with mouse stem cells and we can cure all these diseases in mice, but when we try to do crosswalk that over to human stem cells, there are all kinds of problems. Um, so Austin Smith looked at mouse embryos and looked at the inner cell mass where the, the cells are truly pluripotent and then the, uh, the outer region, the epiblast, and compare that to human stem cells that are cultured in everybody's lab. And what he found is that the human stem cells that are being cultured don't look like the mouse pluripotent stem cells. They look like the mouse stem cells that have already undergone one step of differentiation called primed. And the, the big difference is, is that um, the primed stem cells grow by different growth factors. Primarily, if you feed mouse or human primed stem cells, if you feed them FGF, that's how they grow. So um, uh, to the point of maybe this is the big technical hurdle that we're facing in working with human stem cells, uh, a group of researchers started looking at how do we make human cells go into this very, very early holy grail state so that they will have um, a clean slate, uh, higher yields, better quality stem cells, um, better able to differentiate into the adult cells that will truly be functional like naturally occurring cells. So that's what I'm going to... Wait, I... Here we go. Technical problems. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is an FGF-free system of growing stem cells. Um, and the hurdles that we, uh, that we clear are that um, these are karyotypically stable. Uh, it's using a method that could be uh, FDA approvable, GMP compliant, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science behind that. So we've ar already published on this part that we discovered that this transmembrane protein called MUC1 is in a cleaved growth factor receptor state that we called MUC1 star on every human pluripotent stem cell. And we know that that works as a very powerful growth factor receptor. So here you can see that um, MUC1 is in the cleaved growth factor receptor form when the cells are undifferentiated. As soon as they begin to differentiate, cleavage stops, and MUC1 goes back to the full length quiescent state. You can see um, on the right hand side of the slide that MUC1 star and its ligand, NME1, uh, both co-localize with OCT4. Um, so that says that these are only present in truly pluripotent stem cells. So we published this also. What we found is that NME1, that used to be called NM23, is the ligand that activates this growth factor receptor on stem cells. And the growth factor receptor is activated when the ligand dimerizes the MUC1 star receptor. And what we showed is that if it's the beginning of an embryo, you only have a, a few of these stem cells all secreting NME1. And it, as a dimer, it's active. It promotes pluripotency and it promotes growth. However, when your collection of stem cells gets bigger, you have more enemy one being secreted, and that dimer very quickly goes from the active he uh, dimer to the inactive hexamer. Hexameric enemy uh, one does not bind to the MUC1 star receptor, and in fact, if you add hexameric enemy one to stem cells, you will induce differentiation. 
So at this point, it looks like this is the uh, beautiful model showing how a, an early stem cell growth factor can regulate um, uh, self-replication. And we, we were very happy about that for a while till we discovered that there's a flaw in that model. So here we have NME1 being secreted. It's a dimer. It binds to the MUC1 star growth factor receptor, induces pluripotency and growth. You get a few more stem cells. It's time to uh, start differentiation. The enemy one goes to the hexamer, differentiation, MUC1 cleavage stops, it goes back to the full length. So what's wrong with that model? Cells don't secrete proteins as dimers. They secrete proteins as monomers. So day one of a developing embryo, maybe you only have two cells. Enemy one would be secreted as a monomer. And what's the likelihood it would find its partner and dimerize before it finds a MUC1 star receptor, and actually that will trigger differentiation. So we discovered the, there's a primitive form of enemy one we thought there has to be, um, that it would be secreted as a monomer. As a monomer, it would have two binding sites for the MUC1 star receptor, and that would continue to proliferate for a while. It cannot control itself. It would keep proliferating, uh, keep uh, cells dividing. What we discovered is that BRD4 turns off this primitive enemy protein, and its cofactor, Jumanji 6, turns on expression of enemy 1, which then does regulate self-replication. So here's our system for growing stem cells. We have the stem cells adhering to the surface uh, via an antibody to the MUC1 star receptor. We add a single growth factor, the primitive enemy protein that we call enemy P. And when we want the cells to differentiate, we can add any other small molecules that make the cells become heart cells, neural cells, whatever. But we also add the synthetic peptide that is like the extracellular domain of MUC1 star because that breaks the pluripotency signal and it coordinates differentiation. It also eliminates the risk of teratoma formation because it ensures no pluripotent stem cells will be left. Um, here on the left, we're showing FGF, which every other embryonic or iPS cell is grown in, and you can see the heat map. The gene expression profile is totally different from stem cells, same stem cells, same parent stem cells, but grown in enemy P, the primitive form, or enemy 1. If it's a female source stem cell, uh, one of the gold standards for saying, is it in this early naive state, is are both X's active, um, or has one of the X's already been turned off through trimethylation of, um, of one of the amino acids? What does this mean in terms of making these stem cells differentiate into functional, therapeutically useful cells? Well, here we turn the same stem cells grown in enemy P or FGF, and we, here we're uh, staining for a marker that will show you the sarcomeres or the underlying skeleton, and over that, that's the part that controls the contractions. And you'll see that the FGF-grown cells, the sarcomere structure is a mess, but the enemy P-grown cells have perfect organized sarcomeres. And so on the next slide, um, if I could have the computer guys start this video. This is the video of FGF-grown cells turned into heart cells, and we had to magnify it because a very low percentage of the cells actually will become heart uh, cardiomyocytes. And if we go to the next slide, here's the same cells, but that were first grown in the enemy P. And if you could start that video, please. There's no stirrer bar here. This is just 85 to 100 percent of the cells became heart cells. Their uh, contractions are stronger and they're synchronized. We've done this with uh, every kind of cell that we've differentiated into cardiomyocytes, um, hepatocytes, neural cells. One of the other standards for do you really have naive cells is do you have chimera formation? Um, if you inject the human cells into a mouse embryo or something like that, will they survive? Will they go into the inner cell mass? And we're doing that with the collaborator. It looks like that is the case. 
Um, also, this is a, a universal, naturally occurring growth factor. Monkeys are 98% identical to humans for the receptor and the, the growth factor, the NMEP. And uh, you may or may not know people are having all kinds of trouble growing monkey stem cells, which would be very useful for research and for therapy. Uh, we have no trouble growing rhesus monkey stem cells, uh, synomologous monkey stem cells, and here are just some pictures of those. And lastly, I'll uh, just give a summary of what we've been talking about. This is a naturally occurring growth factor. Um, any, there are four other labs to, who have claimed to have made stem cells, human stem cells, in this holy grail state. They all use FGF um, and or LIF plus biochemical inhibitors. So in other words, they're modeled after the mouse system. This is a human growth factor that we've discovered. Um, our, our system is xeno-free, totally defined. We have no spontaneous differentiation, and they are passed enzymatically as single cells. So what that means is that this can be totally automated, huge yields, high profits, high efficiencies, um, 100,000 cells at day three or day four, you get anywhere from 1 million to 2 million perfect stem cells. Um, if you're making uh, iPS cells for some of these therapeutic purposes, if you are using the Yamanaka factors, for example, in a background of media that contains FGF, the efficiency of making real stable iPS cell lines is, is very poor. Um, our efficiency of iPS generation is 50 times that of generating iPS cells um, in an FGF-based media. And of the few labs that have been able to make human stem cells go back to an earlier state, naive-like, if not totally naive, uh, they're having the problem of these converted cells have abnormal karyotype. And what we found is that if you generate iPS cells in this media of NMEP, they have completely stable karyotype. Uh, we've demonstrated this in 43 different human stem cell lines. We've generated our own stem cell lines. They're stable past uh, passage 30. Some have been tested up to uh, 70 passages. There's no clonal restriction. So this is one of the dirty little secrets that only a few of the people doing stem cell research will talk about. And that's that if you generate iPS cells, from a patient, from a person, you have to test a, a huge number of cells to see which of those iPS lines can form cardiomyocytes or lung cells or hepatocytes. All the tests that we've done so far show that our stem cells generated in NMEP are not clonally restricted. Of the 43 st uh, stem cell lines that we tested, 41 have all formed beating cardiomyocytes, and it's going in the same direction for neural cells, um, neural progenitors, neural cells, and the uh, hepatocytes. So I, I want to thank you with that. Again, our company is Minerva Biotechnologies.